<clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us this morning uh, for this keynote. Uh, my name is Phil Blythe. I'm a professor of ITS at um, Newcastle University in the uh, part of the uh, Decarbonate project. And until the end of May this year, I was also Chief Scientific Advisor at the Department for Transport, where a lot of the work I was doing was the science behind uh, decarbonizing all our transport modes. And there are a lot of different transport modes. And I think something that gets lost sometimes is um, uh, related sectors. And I'm absolutely delighted to have um, uh, Group Captain Blythe Crawford, who is a station commander at RAF Leeming, uh, to speak to us today. Um, We've been doing some work with uh, with, with Blythe and uh, and RF Leeming, um, where the RF is hoping to drive its sustainability agenda by using um, using Leeming as its um, experimental base for all things sustainability, not just not just for transport, uh, but for um, uh, housing and everything else, and also looking at the opportunity of using the real estate within um, Leeming as a um, as a as a place for generating um, clean clean energy as well, so um, that that's been developed through RAFX, which is the innovation part of uh, the RAF, and uh, uh, Blythe and his team have been engaging with academics and uh, and and industry on this for a while now, and there's some really exciting things uh, that he's doing, which you can talk about today. So uh, just just to give you a little bit about Blythe's background, his background is in air defense. He flew the Tornado F3 for 15 years and also had a short stint uh, on the typhoon, Typhoons. Um, his last post was in the Pentagon, where he was part of a team developing the innovation strategy for the US Air Force and has helped develop his passion for innovation. And there is some really, really um, uh, left of field innovation thinking going on in the RF. So I'd like to just hand over to Blythe now. Blythe, you can choose whichever runway you want, one, six, or three, four at Leeming. Okay, chocks away. <laughs> thanks very much, Phil. And thanks for a very, very kind introduction. And uh, and really glad to have the opportunity to talk to you all about what we're trying to do uh, at Leeming. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the, the conference so far. Obviously, I'm coming in and towards the latter end of it. Um, but um, we're very, very keen to drive the uh, innovation agenda and the sustainability agenda forward uh, from an Air Force perspective, particularly through Leeming as being the kind of catalyst uh, for that. Um, in terms of, uh, let me make sure that these will work. There we go. Right, so in terms of uh, the MOD's approach to sustainability, obviously we are a government department, therefore we're mandated to meet government uh, goals and aspirations with regards to um, that agenda uh, and the goals and, and figures that the government are, are quoting. Um, one of the challenges that uh, we have as defence is one of the, the largest let's say, contributors, I would say, all in terms of defence of the UK. So one of our biggest challenges is how do you maintain the balance between that operational output in terms of what we deliver for the country um, against those sustainability targets? Um, and there are going to be some areas where we're going to have to compromise. We'll try and do that by offsetting wherever we possibly can, but simultaneously trying to reduce our emissions um, to as low as possible. Obviously, the government have set a um, uh, goal of carbon net zero by 2050 um, in typical um, ambitious format. The RAF have turned around and said, no, we're aiming for 2040, so, uh, so no pressure. Um, but then across other areas of defence, we have been set some uh, exciting um, challenges as well. So the government white fleet, um, i.e. our um, vehicles that like cars and buses and things that, that we employ, um, have to be 25% uh, electric by uh, next year. I'm pleased to say at Leeming we're already at 25%, so uh, we're making good progress, uh, and then 100% by 2027. And interestingly, that 2027 figure only got brought forward last week from 2030. And I think that's another challenge that we're going to have as people become more and more ambitious with this, that those targets are going to be brought further forward uh, throughout. Our first approach to tackling and addressing um, sustainability and carbon net zero was through the, uh, the integrated review, which was conducted last year, um, where we had a specific focus on global warming and sustainability as being uh, challenges that we in defense and wider security had to address. Uh, and obviously some of the bullet points there you, you'll be aware of in terms of 
government aspirations as to where the UK want to sit um, within that timeline. And obviously, we need to uh, conform to that as well, which was articulated, as I say, in the integrated review last year. In terms of uh, the wider MOD, um, we have some of our own work on this as well. So we, we produced a paper last year um, focused on climate change and our strategic approach to that, that articulates our support for UK legislation and the Prime Minister's um, 10 point plan. Obviously, the challenge we will have is as fossil fuels and aviation fuels start to diminish um, uh, in time, we will have to pivot to something different. Uh, and one of the challenges that I see um, from an Air Force perspective is um, if you go right back 60, 70 years, the, I would argue that the Air Force was at the sort of cutting edge of innovation when you look at jet engines, etc. We seem to have allowed that to lapse in time and we are now laggards with regard to the adoption of more broader national technology. Uh, and we end up looking at a cut solution um, and buying stuff off the shelf rather than being involved in the development of those. So one of the primary drivers for my ambition at Leeming is to move from being a laggard um, through being a fast adopter to being at the leading edge of some of this capability development. And that's the primary driver for my rationale for engaging uh, with academia and with startups to try and engage at that lower TRL level so that we can work um, collaboratively together to develop out um, those capabilities. Obviously, Net Zero has already started. Um, it does, it's not all, oh my God, this is going to be really, really difficult for defence. There are some operational technical advantages to going uh, towards Net Zero as far as we're concerned. Um, and I'll come cover some of those um, shortly. But just to sort of re-emphasize, emphasize the point, we do have to have um, some trade-offs between combat being combat capable and what we're actually delivering um, and meeting those guidelines. And that's something you just need to be cognizant of um, as we move forward. So what are some of those advantages that, uh, that I talked about? Um, obviously, um, reducing energy and fuel costs is, is something we're all very, very keen to do. It's probably one of the most expensive parts um, of our enterprise. Uh, and I, I would also uh, argue that, you know, over the last three or four, well, the last seven or eight decades, I would say, um, we keep trying to go faster, bigger, carry more stuff in terms of the sort of air environment. But more recently in the last 10 years, with the sort of advancements in miniaturization, there's the potential now to do a lot more with a lot smaller platform, which will reduce some of the burden that we have on, uh, on aviation fuel. Um, uh, also, there's, you know, obviously a, a societal part of that as well in terms of reducing our reliance on those fossil fuels and demonstrating to the rest of the country that we are taking this forward um, and we're taking it seriously uh, and therefore, um, you know, getting wider um, public support for, uh, for what we're trying to do. We also are challenged, and we are challenged with this today, on uh, legal constraints and operating in other parts of the world where those, some of those nations that host us um, have strong, a strong environmental focus. Um, I would argue the US see this uh, day in, day out with their use of uh, nuclear carriers, for example, um, and one of the rationales for the two carriers that the UK have um, not being nuclear uh, was based around that uh, that argument that there were areas of the world where they would not allow us to uh, to operate um, with, with that on board. Um, so that those sort of constraints, um, and as we move forward and people become more and more um, sustainability focused, um, I can see our uh, ability to operate being more and more constrained unless we adopt that strong environmental focus ourselves. There is also the challenge of availability of fuel and access to it. Uh, and one of the things that I'm, I'm working with the team here on and, and downstream with Phil on is not just about use of hydrogen and, uh, and electric for powering um, vehicles and aircraft and the like, but also the generation of those on site and the storage of those on site. Uh, for example, my resilience at Leeming um, in terms of our backup generators, our diesel generators. Well, if I could build a bit of factory farm uh, on this that I'm constantly topping up using sustainable energy, um, and replace all of that diesel generation and with electric that we where we generate and store the electric ourselves, that surely is a good thing. There's also an advantage just in terms of platform performance. So um, reduced noise we've talked about there, um, IR and heat signatures, 
um, operating an electric um, aircraft is going to be stealthier than operating at one with grip plumes of black smoke coming out the back of it. Um, and even, you know, today's platforms are a lot cleaner um, than, than some of the older ones. And we used to joke about that when we, uh, well, let's say, doing dog fighting against other nations where you could see them coming from 40 miles away with the black plumes of smoke uh, in the sky. But uh, so there are operational advantages uh, in terms of taking this uh, this forward. And then, of course, um, going back to the point on cost, if we are aligned with um, the wider environment in terms of um, using the same types of energy and the same types of fuel, um, it is obviously cheaper than it drives down the cost um, from our perspective. There's also the cultural bit. Uh, our younger generation, uh, our Generation Z that's joining the Air Force today are incredibly focused on sustainability. Uh, and I am constantly prodded um, by my, my people at work about why we're not doing better on it. Um, so there's a real opportunity here to be seen to be at the leading edge of this and to provide global leadership in support of the government's agenda on, uh, on climate change sustainability. To give you an indication of our emissions challenge, uh, as I say, the MOD generates about 50% of the emissions of government as, as a whole. And of that, the Royal Air Force generates about 42%. So we have quite a challenge uh, on our hands. The air is state in terms of our, our laydown, because air bases tend to be quite big, um, generates again 20% of, uh, of RAF emissions. So when you combine all of that, um, there are some significant challenges there for us. However, there are also some significant opportunities. Uh, because our estate being so big, um, we have lots of land and, and opportunities to use natural resources for generation of power and um, that we wouldn't have if we were constrained uh, otherwise. Three themes that we're kind of focused on and um, within the service, there's the net zero negative estate. So uh, how can I use, let's say, some of our ranges, which are open areas of, of countryside to potentially offset uh, areas with, with, where we cannot reduce carbon um, across other areas of the state. So there's an opportunity to do that. Um, exploiting the natural environment, as I said, uh, what used to be RAF Linum uh, down in Wiltshire is now um, a very, very large solar farm. Um, so there's some opportunities, uh, again, to exploit the state in that regard. We're trying to get to net zero uh, aviation and uh, looking at electric in the first instance, and we have Project Talon, which is focused around our university air squadrons, trying to get that fleet electric by 2027. Uh, so again, starting small, but then planning to scale, uh, and then looking obviously at hydrogen downstream as well. And I think you, Phil and I have talked about this before, we're probably about 10 years behind in terms of the hydrogen um, vehicle power uh, from where we were with, with electric um, in terms of timeline. So how do we accelerate some of that hydrogen usage? And, and we're looking at doing some of that uh, at Leeming as well. And then finally, sort of net zero uh, on business as usual. So just the approach we take to uh, from everything right across the service. And, and part of this uh, is focused around some of the work, again, we're doing at Leeming, where I have, for example, 700 comms engineers that live on one side of the, the, of the base who get up in their car and get into their car every morning to drive the 500 yards to another car park to go and work it in their office. So uh, we've just recently partnered with uh, with Lime. We've got electric scooters all across the station now. And whilst that will not reduce our carbon footprint significantly, there is a cultural aspect to this as well, whereby putting them onto the base, we're demonstrating to our people that we actually take it seriously um, and uh, encouraging them to use those rather than, than cars. Obviously, the obvious answer is to get out and walk. Um, or take a bicycle, but um, but we're on a cultural journey, and uh, and we need to take the, the people with us as, as we do that. Uh, as I mentioned, there are loads of opportunities um, right across the service, and that's my base. That is Leeming, right in the heart of God's country, as you can see, surrounded by farmland. Surrounded, we've got a river right next to us as well, um, the Swale, which is fast flowing, and, and opportunities to exploit that, but. One of the things we're conscious of is trying to boil the ocean um, all in one go. So through some of the work we're doing, um, specifically through Project Vital, which I'll talk to in a moment, um, we're trying to focus uh, our attention to where we get greatest bang for our buck um, and uh, where we can try and act as a catalyst then for the rest of the service 
uh, to take that uh, work forward. So some of the areas that we're specifically looking at, and this is sort of Air Force uh, wide, uh, energy efficient buildings and um, the Defence Infrastructure Organisation actually own all of our estates. So whilst we can uh, shout all we like as an Air Force about why the fact they haven't got solar panels and everything, the Defence Infrastructure Organisation manage that for us on, on our behalf. Uh, we've got some fairly ambitious infra plans um, at Leeming over the next few years. We're resurfacing, they're building a new runway in uh, and resurfacing all of our airfield operating services. So one of the things that I'm really keen to do is to exploit this opportunity as far as we can and look at things like um, heat exchangers, et cetera, uh, under the runway. Classic vignette, I spend a fortune every year putting um, slightly toxic de-icer down onto, uh, onto a runway. Um, and in the summertime, my runway gets uh, in incredibly hot. So uh, why don't we put some sort of heat exchanger under the runway where I can draw off that heat and use it as energy in the summertime and then flick the switch in the winter and provide underfloor heating for my runway so I don't have to put uh, de-icer on it. So uh, there's some novel opportunities with that as well. Part of the challenge here is um, we are a government organisation, which means we're incredibly bureaucratic uh, and trying to turn the oil tanker that is the Defence Infrastructure Organisation is a difficult task uh, and, and they tend to uh, lead turn every project with several years worth of bureaucracy so uh, it's getting in early um, and quickly to try and drive that process. Obviously, across airfields, we've got lots of airfield lighting and there's uh, some novel solutions to look at that from an energy perspective, as you can see uh, on the screen. Um, and then even things like, you know, changing all of our light bulbs um, and making them more efficient uh, as well. We have a trials underway across the defence estate with carport um, solar. Um, and then uh, electric charging points that then come off that to charge vehicles. That's being done at the small scale at the moment, but there's opportunity to then um, scale that up. Um, and then some small medium wind energy. Obviously, the challenge we have with wind and airfields is that uh, wind turbines tend to uh, get picked up by our radar and look like aircraft. Um, so uh, we tend to shy away from, uh, from large uh, wind farms, but small and medium, um, there's an opportunity to exploit that. And then um, geothermal, groundwater and air source heat pumps, uh, Leeming, for example, is covered in boreholes. So there's an opportunity there to exploit um, geothermal uh, and more about that in, uh, in a second. Some other areas we're looking at, um, biosynthetic fuels, one, uh, that is a novel one that we specifically at Leeming and RAFX are looking at is on behalf of the Red Arrows. So uh, everybody likes to see red, white and blue smoke coming out the back, um, but it is diesel. It's effectively being burnt out the back of it with some dye in it. Uh, so we have been set the challenge um, for COP26 to have a Red Arrows display at that uh, conference um, with some uh, environmentally friendly smoke coming out the back. So uh, that's uh, a big challenge that we're working with some of the universities down in Lincolnshire on at the moment. Um, obviously we get lots of banter about green smoke. Apparently green is one of the hardest um, dyes to make. So uh, we'll be keeping it probably red, white and blue, um, but we're trying to find an uh, environmentally friendly way of doing that. There are obviously opportunities for energy scavenging. Um, I'll be uh, exploring some of that as I go through the tube today on my way back to Yorkshire. Um, but, you know, we've all got big gymnasiums right across our bases where it all seems slightly bizarre to me that you, you plug a treadmill into the wall and draw um, energy from outside to operate something where you're actually burning energy yourself. Um, how can we turn all of that around? Potentially put a battery farm outside our gym um, and you could almost sort of set challenges then for your people um, to get the battery charged to certain levels from certain times. Anyway, there's lots of novel ways of exploring that. Water efficiency and harvesting is something that's particularly um, attractive to me. Um, one of the challenges we have at Leeming is we've got the hardest water in the country. So I'm constantly throwing out toilets and showers, um, and I reckon it costs me almost £300,000 a year in terms of um, our water being so hard that it destroys our pipes. Um, so if I can start to use um, grey water um, or rainwater to, um, to support you know, bathrooms and, and toilets and, and car washes, etc. Why would I not be doing that? And again, there's a lot of work going on with DIO to try and drive that work forward. Ultra low emission vehicles, 
as I say, um, we uh, are already at 25% electric fleet at Leeming. Our aspiration is to get to 100 by 2027. Um, and we're working very closely with Phil and we have aspirations to look at putting uh, an emissions free hydrogen vehicle uh, as a trial demonstrator at Leeming by the beginning of next year. So some very exciting opportunities ahead um, on the vehicle side of it um, as well. In terms of our approach to it over the next sort of uh, 15 years, um, this is the wider sort of uh, generic Air Force plan in terms of baselining the energy and carbon usage that we have over the first few years, and then uh, driving uh, energy efficiency, uh, as you see, between 24 and 27, exploiting clean, clean energy beyond that, and then exploiting the infra programs. At Leeming, we are trying to bite off on some of that uh, early to sort of lead turn it purely to inform some of those decisions um, that are coming downstream. So that puts us at the uh, at the front edge of, uh, of where the Air Force is going. One of the reasons why, or the main reason, why are we doing this at Leeming? Uh, it's, it's an unusual base in the fact that we've got all elements of the Air Force represented in one location. So I can explore sustainability and carbon net zero across multiple uh, areas of the base and multiple functions that the Air Force performs. For example, uh, I have a uni two university air squadrons there. We're hoping to get those electric, as I said, by 2027. Uh, I have two Hawk squadrons at the moment, uh, which gives me opportunity to experiment with the fast jet side of things. Uh, we train uh, two regiment squadrons um, at Leeming as well, so in ground-based operations. Uh, and then we also have um, training units for our expeditionary air wings and our joint air terminal controllers, et cetera, as well. So there's a lot of different activity going on that allows you to explore sustainability across multiple use cases. We're also a perfect little petri dish because everything is behind the wire uh, on the real estate. So we can afford to fail um, without necessarily affecting operations uh, elsewhere and learn from it and move on. And then, of course, the environment itself. We were 14 kilometers around the outside. We've got two and a half kilometers of waterfront um, where we can potentially look at water turbines, for example, into the swale. There's a lot of areas of the real estate not utilized, which is leased back to our local farmers that we could be exploiting for energy generation. Uh, and as I mentioned, the, the site is covered in multiple boreholes that go right back to uh, World War II, where there are geothermal operation uh, opportunities there. Um, and we're actually working in partnership with the Eden Project um, on doing on exploring some of that. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, Eden uh, started drilling about uh, two months ago. They're drilling down to four and a half kilometers, so slightly further than us, uh, where the water temperature is 300 degrees Celsius, and they're planning to power the whole of the Eden project uh, from geothermal by 2023. So we're taking a lot of their lessons on board, um, and obviously ours is much smaller scale, um, but there are lessons that can be drawn um, directly across. So Project Vital, what we're doing with it in that, um, this is our sustainability project. We've got uh, a, a bunch of interlinked and mutually supporting projects that primarily focus around the core part of VITAL as well, but we're using opportunities to leverage up um, through cross-government department collaboration with Department for Transport, with DCMS, uh, and, uh, and exploring uh, and effectively providing Leeming as an opportunity for them to experiment um, there as well. We're exploiting our innovation hub. Um, RAFX uh, is focused around using lean startup methodologies um, to develop a minimum viable product. And then the idea is we beta test it tested to death at Leeming um, and then decide whether to press pivot or kill it and um, before then scaling it across the uh, service. So we're using the sort of best in practice uh, capability development processes so as we can do this uh, quickly um, and in collaboration with lots of partners. One of the things I'm very focused on is uh, collaboration, I think. Collaboration needs competition for breakfast. So, um, you know, we're really keen to engage with partners, um, pan government, pan academia, uh, and within the startup community as well. In terms of um, how that links to some of the other work that we're doing within RAFX, so Project Vital, uh, as you can see there, is focused on the sustainability aspect. Uh, that's a moss wall that we're putting in, um, top right, to understand the pollutants that we have in the atmosphere. Uh, and then looking at moss to potentially uh, offset or, or, or gather some of that to, uh, to make our air a bit cleaner. One of the exciting aspects of what we're doing is exploiting, exploiting technology to inform our sustainability agenda. 
so we have a separate project going uh, on called Project Connect, where we have just recently set up the uh, MOD's first uh, Internet of Things testbed, exploding 5G. So we have the opportunity here to put loads of low power sensors across the station and actually measure um, our uh, emissions and carbon footprint and create essentially a digital twin of the station from a sustainability perspective. And then another area of focus from, for myself is what we call Project Wellness, uh, which is focused on the mental health and well-being of our people. And one of the things that we uh, exploited during COVID uh, in particular, um, given the fact that all my community if we live behind the wire, we set up a polytunnel um, for our people to start growing their own fruit and veg. Uh, so we've got 85 raised beds uh, on base. Interestingly, we discovered that the people who got involved with that were not my green-fingered people um, who lived on base, but more people who had just come back from operations. So we're doing a study at the moment with Durham University to understand the metrics behind how getting out and doing gardening and growing your own things helps your mental health and well-being. Everybody knows it's good for you, we just don't know how much. So that's where we're bringing the academics in. And that project has just continued to expand. So we're now doing beekeeping on station. We've got our own chickens, cheapest eggs in Yorkshire, if anybody wants to pop by. And uh, and it's it's really, really thriving, but helping the environment, sustainability of the station, as well as looking after the mental health and well-being of our people. As I said, I'm very, very keen on collaboration um, over competition. Um, we're obviously partnered with uh, with Phil and the team at Newcastle. Um, as I mentioned, we're doing some stuff with Durham University as well, Eden on geothermal, but also Eden on some of that mental health and well-being aspects. Um, they are doing that with uh, mental health institutions in St. Austell. Uh, so there's some mutually supporting and shared lessons from that. Uh, and then we're also partnered with, uh, with the Royal Horticultural Society as well, who have provided a lot of support in terms of uh, establishing those uh, ecosystems across the station. The point is, uh, and the thing that I keep saying is, you know, this is a whole of nation effort um, to basically address the sustainability agenda, to make a better life for um, our population downstream. So we should all be collaborating on this um, and uh, exploiting the best talent and, and opportunities that are out there. And the other thing that I find about through the collaboration aspect of it, it gives you a lot more access to funding streams that other people might be able to leverage um, which you would not ha otherwise have access to. So it, it works for everybody in that regard. So in terms of the five kind of areas that we're focused on within Vital, just to give you a quick sort of overview of some of those, um, the first project that we're focused on is on carbon footprint accounting. So baselining the station um, from the onset, because everybody talks about, you know, solar and wind power and hydrogen um, vehicles, et cetera. But actually, you might be able to most effectively reduce your energy footprint by insulating your buildings properly. So one of the first things that I've done is uh, I have some drone operators on station. We are thermal imaging. We've already thermal imaged map, uh, done a thermal image map of the entire site. So as I can understand where we're leaking energy from um, across our real estate. And let's just get some of our insulation fixed in the first instance uh, to make that better. Along with doing that, um, we are creating a, a digital um, bird table, essentially a 3D uh, model of the entire site. Um, our nirvana in this regard is um, we're working with Microsoft and exploiting HoloLens too. Um, but if I could create um, a 3D, you know, virtual, um, virtual aug augmented uh, map of the station, where I can essentially, you know, control the energy uh, consumption of my buildings and my carbon footprint um, through augmented reality. Um, well, why wouldn't I do it? And I think, you know, the opportunity, the technology is there right now. Um, I just need to join the dots. So we're currently um, joining those dots as we speak. It will also give us an indication um, across the wider estate where we have opportunities to reduce or offset. And we're addressing both of those um, which you'll see in a moment. Um, integrated solar, uh, again, this comes back to my point about being at the sort of cutting edge of technology rather than being a laggard. The first thing that a lot of people said to me was, why don't you put a big solar farm in, you know, right across the estate? Well, solar farms, uh, you know, take up a lot of space um, and they're a little bit um, 1990s. So uh, one of the things we're keen to do is to work with uh, the universities um, Newcastle, Edinburgh and Swansea have collaborated already in terms of generating solar cells that can be rolled out in sheets like Lino. 
and they reckon we're only five to ten years off potentially having paint and um, that can be energy absorbent um, as well so um, there is there's opportunity to be at the front end of that um, and integrating that into our systems where I paper my buildings in it rather than necessarily setting up a, a solar farm across the whole of the site. Carbon capture is another one that we're working on and this this follows on from a lot of really good work done uh, up at Newcastle when um, they built the Newcastle Helix site on the site of the old uh, Nuki Brown Brewery if you remember it and what they discovered there was that a lot of the crushed rock and uh, concrete was absorbing uh, and fixing carbon um, as calcium carbonate minerals. So if, if you, you apply these dressings then to the, the surface, you potentially uh, can absorb a significant amount of carbon from the atmosphere. Um, and it also saves you planting a forest. Everybody's trying to set up carbon tokens now, but if you plant a forest to do it, uh, you basically, you know, set that site, uh, site uh, aside for, uh, for up to 40 years before you can then do anything else, uh, do anything else with it. Um, spreading an aggregate across the top, um, such as rumen or biochar, which is what we're uh, experimenting with at the moment, still allows you to use the real estate in the way you have before, but it's now absorbing a lot more carbon from the atmosphere simultaneously. So we've been running that for about a year now. We've got a football pitch sized area on the far side of the airfield with different concentrations um, and we're uh, absorbing carbon there. And the results have been exceptionally good so far. A 15% increase, I think, in the first month um, and constantly increasing since. And you've got some of the facts and figures on there to, uh, to back that up. The geothermal I've talked about already, one of the advantages of Leeming is the fact that we've got boreholes there already. So again, um, we're working with uh, Professor Dave Manning up at uh, Newcastle, uh, who's one of the country's leading soil scientists to look at uh, how we can exploit that a little bit further. We also have the advantage of having a very high water table at Leeming, um, which allows heat exchange um, a lot more easily than, uh, than if you didn't. So uh, there's a real opportunity there to exploit this, um, particularly at Leeming. Different sites will have different um, priorities based on their real estate. So again, we're trying to understand the different opportunities that there are and then model it accordingly for other sites um, across defence. Hydrogen economy and sustainable transport, obviously, as I said, um, we are actually 25% now already. Um, we're looking at micro mobility across the station uh, as well. Um, currently partnered with Lime, but we want to do some experimentation with them as well in terms of, you know, obviously you plug them into the mains at the moment, but what if we had solar charging points um, for scooters instead? Um, again, no reason why people can't get out and walk, um, but there's a cultural change we're trying to drive with this as well. And then as Phil has mentioned, we're very keen to, uh, to drive forward the hydrogen agenda, not just from the vehicle perspective, but then hydrogen generation and storage. And that's quite a sexy topic in defense uh, at the moment. And obviously having a river running around uh, the edge of your airfield is kind of handy from a hydrogen generation perspective uh, as well. And then the final sort of project within that is the sort of life cycling assessment and, and costing. So one of the things I'm keen to exploit is uh, circular economies. So we're partnered with a living lab that was set up by University of Oxford who are partnered with their city council. They've been running for about three years uh, and one of the things that I want to understand is, for example, I have um, Catrick Garrison, uh, only 15 minutes up the road, uh, a large real estate, but an estate that is very heavily built upon. Um, and we may have be able to offset, let's say, some carbon for them, uh, or they may be able to take some of our waste material and turn it into energy. How do we start creating that sort of circular economy where we're all mutually supporting from a sustainability perspective? And it doesn't have to be pan defense. There's opportunities here to integrate with the local community. And in my case, North Yorkshire County Council um, as well. So again, comes back to my point about collaboration being stronger than uh, competition, particularly in this uh, environment where we all have a social responsibility to try and drive this really important work uh, forward. So that's kind of uh, my pitch as to where we're at. Um, hopefully that's given you an insight into our broader ambitions uh, but also, more importantly, what we're specifically doing uh, at Leeming. Uh, and uh, hopefully that's stirred a little bit of debate and thought. And uh, I'm open for any questions or discussion. Thank you. That's fantastic, uh, Blythe. Um, absolutely fascinating. And it, it puts into perspective when, when, when we see that the MAD itself 
um, is responsible for 50% of um, greenhouse gas emissions across government. Uh, and yet, you know, when we think about COP and that, it's, it's barely mentioned as, as one of the challenges. So I think you've really given us a, uh, an insight into the opportunities and the, the work that you're doing to really, really make uh, Leeming the, the lead side for the MOD in this. Um, I, I've got some questions and comments in the chat I'd like to go through if that's okay. Yeah, um, absolutely. I've just opened chat and I'm seeing them uh, now myself. Okay. So, yeah. so the, the first one was from Tom regarding nuclear ships. You said that uh, we deliberately didn't make our carriers nuclear because you're not allowed to go and park them in Australia, for example. Um, although, yeah. conversely, they are they are low carbon. I, I guess I guess that's more of a comment. You can't really make much uh, uh, beyond that. Um, the, the interesting one, we, we, because you've got such a built estate, um, the, the um, uh, Danny was asking about: Are, are you looking at um, new construction methods and and um, uh, low carbon and zero carbon construction? For your future, uh, for your future builds on site. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, one of the things that um, DIO will build into the contract or the competition um, contract, because we obviously don't do the building ourselves; it'll be contracted out. But part of the conditions of contract will be doing things in a in a sustainable uh, way. So the um, the work that's ongoing at the moment is to try and ensure that our policies for contractorization in that regard. Um, uh, have those built in uh, and the other bit that I'm very keen to push is to future proof this as much as you possibly can so if you have an opportunity of going over and above let's exploit that as far as we can and I think there is a almost a social charter uh, um, side of it as well where I would if I was running the competition want to be uh, awarding points for um, people looking at it from a more futuristic perspective, from a sustainability bit, rather than just conforming to the uh, current guidance and, and policy. Um, so that's it's. I don't own it, but I'm pushing that agenda very, very hard. And uh, I know that the uh, sustainability leads in defence uh, and defence infrastructure organisation are doing that too. As I say, our biggest challenge there is the fact that they start planning these um, large scale projects. Um, two to three years in advance. Um, I've then got to try and break some of that, um, break some of that bureaucracy to, uh, to get the innovation uh, elements um, wedded into it, but um, we are pushing hard. Okay, um, th there's a couple of questions uh, broadly asking the same thing about the military and defense establishment, uh, recognizing it's a, it's a key contributor to global emissions and asking is, is there um, collaboration internationally on this? And you did mention you've been at a, a defense uh, show down in London where sustainability was less than high on the agenda. Yes, um, and uh, I think we've got a long way to go with that. So interestingly, um, yesterday morning, I bumped into a colleague of mine at breakfast uh, uh, from the US, um, Kevin Billings, who was a previous um, Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Installations and Energy. Uh, he um, is now affiliated to the Royal Air Force um, and uh, he is leading our Global Air Chiefs Sustainability Challenge. So again, the Chief of the Royal Air Force has now taken on board the responsibility of being effectively an ambassador for sustainability across national, multinational air forces. Uh, and we have now set up a multinational forum on sustainability uh, which our chief is leading and, and Kev is, is trying to drive some of that work through. So, uh, so absolutely. And in terms of just lower level tactical collaboration, um, uh, we at Leeming have partnered both with uh, Nellis Air Force Base uh, in uh, Las Vegas. Um, I do pick them. Um, <laughs> it wasn't going to be North Dakota. Uh, um, so we're partnered with Nellis in Vegas. We're also partnered with Miramar. Um, bizarrely because everybody likes Top Gun and, uh, and one of the rationales for that is Murmur have, uh, have developed a, a micro electricity grid across their own station that makes them independent of the grid around San Diego and allows them to operate in a sustainable way uh, and they've covered their site in um, renewable energy uh, generation plants as well. Uh, Nellis is sort of leading the way in terms of uh, solar, etc. And we're, we've also been doing some stuff with the Air National Guard in Texas on geothermal. So it's right on the top of everybody's agenda, but that pan collaboration bit is just starting to kick off now through the Global Air Chiefs 
um, uh, meeting, which, uh, as I say, um, my chief is leading on in terms of driving that agenda. And, and, and I guess if you have that as a as a, uh, uh, a demand across a number of different nations, then the the industries and B, BAE is mentioned in the chat as well, who who have to supply you know that there's a there's a market there and there's a real demand. So I guess it, it, it self sustains after a while. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as I said, I had a chat with British Airspace yesterday who um, are now really keen to come in and collaborate with us from the RAFX perspective. Uh, and the chief executive is coming to see me next week to talk about how they can partner with us on the sustainability side of things. So um, they recognise now that there's an opportunity to come in at the conceptual phase uh, and work with us to develop some of these capabilities rather than just trying to sell us a cult solution um, downstream. Okay. Uh, in the chat, a number of people were interested in your comments about how, how can we use the gym to generate... Yeah, I'm, I'm reading Eon's energy. point. Um, so, I, I thought that's really fascinating. I'd yeah, and you, thoughts you know, that. that's, that's something I'm, I'm really, really keen to, to explore. We haven't done an awful lot in this area, and most of what I've just, you know, discussed already is sort of my ideas about how we should be doing it. But obviously... Um, you know, as he's mentioned in there, um, there's low tech mag and about student accommodation being self powered. I am mad keen to explore some of that. Um, that that that's an area we haven't done an awful lot of work in, but I think it is a quick win, particularly you know when I've got a population who have to pass an annual fitness test um, and who are out you know running around the station and, and doing you know exercising on a regular basis. Why would we not do that and exploit that? So I'm, I'd be very keen to uh, to engage in that further. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of work on power scavenging, just carrying devices on you that generate a, a, a amount of energy that enables you to you, you know operate all the things in your your own body area network, your phones, etc. I think I think this is really fascinating, and the fact you've got complete control of it within your site is is interesting. Um, there was there was a question. We've also thought about us. You know, I've even thought about a springy runway. <laughs> <laughs> that that yeah. might cause a few concerns with people, uh, though. But, you know, we're landing very heavy aircraft onto a surface where the main goal of, after they land is to slow them down as quickly as possible. So if you did have some sort of compress, only, you know, you could measure it out, but some degree of compressibility in a runway, for example, you're getting a big power, you know, load from each landing, um, but then you're also helping to slow the aircraft down um, in a much in, in a quicker fashion as well. So everybody's a win-win. But maybe that's slightly left of field, but um, you never know. That isn't that the point. You've got the opportunity to think about things like that. You know, and any any slowing down, you know, dissipating energy, and that energy can be captured elsewhere. Yeah, interesting. Um, another question uh, was regarding uh, li life assets and asking what, what's the biggest things that you procure beyond aircraft and how long do they last? So if you make a decision to procure something now, how long will it be with you? And if you procure something that isn't um, sustainable or low carbon, it's going to be around for a long time. Yeah, so I think uh, obviously the the, the big um, the bigger defence projects like aircraft, we generally spend um, around fifteen years developing that platform, and then we would expect to get about a twenty five year um, life cycle out of it. The biggest challenge we have with that is the rate of change of technology, and so we're not just trying to reduce those timelines, um, you know, from a uh, a practical perspective, but also from the fact that by the time you've built your platform, technology has moved on 15 years um, and it's completely outdated. So we need to look at a much more um, efficient and effective way of uh, developing the platforms in the first uh, instance and then sustaining them downstream. Uh, to try and then start building those sustainable platforms, you know, you know, we'd need to be thinking about about it right now and planning it right now. And obviously, the Tempest program is is the the, the biggest one that the Air Force are focused on. Um, but again, not delivering for at least another um, ten years. Um, so we don't know what 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 is your sustainability technology sector likely to be like in ten years' time. And are we creating a platform that is already 10 years behind that by the time we bring it into surface, service? So there's, there's definitely a lot of work to be done in that regard. Outside of the, the key platform aircraft, 
craft. It's mostly just around the, the estate, I would argue. Um, and, you know, you saw on there that our estate accounts for some still 20% um, of our carbon output. So um, the platforms and the estate are our two primary areas of focus at the moment. Um, but again, as I mentioned earlier, there's some opportunities to use the estate for offsetting uh, simultaneously. So uh, that's why the sort of carbon accounting bit is so important in terms of that first experimental strand that we're doing to understand where we get greatest bang for buck um, and can, uh, can put uh, our money where it matters and can deliver most effectively. Yeah, and, and the carbon accounting, I think, because you've got a bounded area, um, you, you, can, you can do things in a much more uh, um, accurate way than you can, you know, trying to aggregate it across a whole city, for example. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, one last question was regarding, um, do, do, you, do you look at adapting your operations to reduce emissions as well? I mean, you mentioned trying to persuade people to not drive 500 yards from their, their accommodation to their, their signals, uh, their building and the like, but uh, other things? Yeah, um, you know, there's, so let me give you a, another example of something we're doing at the moment. Um, we have, uh, an, we've been doing some experimentation oh, just over this last week on some of our networking capabilities. So here's an example. We send um, a whole bunch of people down to the Falkland Islands uh, every year to control the radar sites that are down there um, because that's where the radar is. So that we've just been demonstrating um, over the last week our ability to um, use our networks to transfer that picture to anywhere in the world. So um, hopefully you get a chance to see it film in the next few weeks. But at the back of our building, we've got a tent set up at the moment with a couple of aerials around it where the guys are, control are, are looking at the radar picture from Port Treath rather than being in Portrait looking at our rare pictures. So there's an opportunity there to save um, deploying people and deploying things overseas because you're now networked and you don't have to do that. So if we've got an opportunity of not sending an aircraft somewhere with a load of people on it on, on a regular basis um, because we've now got networks that can do that or we've got uh, operations that are now automated rather than uh, demanding to have a human in the loop and actually go somewhere to do something, and um, why would we not do that? So yeah, uh, I think we're yeah, applying that absolutely. right across the board. And I guess the final bit is, that I talk about is on the miniaturization side of it. Um, you know, why would we not exploit that from a sustainable in supporting, for example, a C-130 that you see there in the background um, on, on the picture? Yes, good, good question. Um, and yeah, everybody's struggling with the whole idea of how much travel do you need to do in the future? Can we do much more remotely as, as we have been doing through COVID? W one last question, another bit of interesting innovation. But we, Why but we miss the wine and canopies, Phil, as you said. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, arrest the hooks. Is that a good way of yeah. um, scavenging energy from a landing aircraft? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and Ian's got lots See lots of ideas there, so uh, I'd love to catch up with them at some point and uh, and go through them. But you know, particularly on carriers um, now. Obviously, we designed a carrier for the UK that uses um, primarily due to cost because we were looking at electromagnetic um, arrest cables um, and, and launch platforms, which um, I think we're going to cost us about three billion um, to put those onto the two carriers. So, um, you know, obviously, American platforms all use arrestor hooks. Um, and uh, the, absolutely, there's, there's a perfect opportunity there to do it. And I believe that the later the Gerald Ford class carrier um, has uh, a restor that is actually um, using that in a similar way. So the same way as we use um, your brake on your uh, electric car to, uh, to generate energy as well. Okay. Look, Blythe, that, that's been fascinating. I think you've opened the eyes of, of many of us into a whole new area for, of challenge for sustainability. And uh, it sounds like you, you, you're, you're, you're really ahead of the game and, you know, the, the, the leaving is really open for business and ideas coming from the academic and uh, the, uh, the startup community to, uh, to, to, to propose and, and test at Leeming. So thank you so much. Really, really appreciate that.